Hey everybody, this is Dan. Uh, today I'd like to share a chess game with you. Um, actually, the, the reason I'm sharing this chess game is because it's a really good showcase for a chess opening system called the Stonewall Attack. And um, this particular example game uh, showcasing this opening, I took from the Wikipedia entry on this Stonewall Attack opening. Um, according to the citation on the Wikipedia page, it was originally featured in an article by Larry Evans, the late Grandmaster, um, in the uh, maybe it was 1997. I'm not totally sure, but anyway, um, I wasn't really able to figure out whether this was a game that he created just to illustrate the opening, or whether this was an actual game played by two players um, in actual competition. So, if you have any information about where this game actually came from, I'd be curious to hear it. But I took it from the Wikipedia entry, and that's kind of all I know beyond the fact that Larry Evans wrote about it. Um, so anyway, it's a really, really good illustration of this opening. And the reason that the Stonewall Attack is um, an opening that I, I believe is to be recommended, especially to beginning players, is that this is an opening system in which you don't have to depend so much on your opponent making particular moves and following one specific or even two or three specific lines um, or variations. It's kind of like you have your opening plan and in most cases you'll be able to execute it regardless of the moves that your opponent chooses. So in other words, it's very flexible and you'll be able to use it more often it's easy to remember, it's easy to play, and it usually involves a clear plan. So it's a good opening to start out with, and then maybe while you're using it, uh, you can also start to study other more involved openings that require more actual knowledge and background. But in any case, let's take a look at the game and see uh, how this opening goes and how White uses it here. So it's an opening for White. And white, in this particular game, although you don't have to always do the moves in the same order, um, in this particular game, white opened d4, black played d5. So both players establish a pawn in the center and um, liberate the queenside bishops and um, prepare for future developments. Okay, white continues with f4. Now this is the one of the key moves in the stonewall attack and... Um, there's actually an opening for black that's called the, the Dutch Stonewall that uh, has black responding to white's d4 with an uh, advance of the f-pawn. So this advance of the f-pawn is a typical and a critical idea in the Stonewall. Um, also, I, I suppose, um, from what I gather, this is the, the main reason why Grandmaster level players don't normally play this type of opening because they, they feel that this kind of f-pawn advance weakens the king side. And while that may be true, uh, I think, especially when you're not a grandmaster or, or any kind of titled player, um, it doesn't really matter because your opponent isn't going to play perfectly, so the initiative and the plan that you get out of the opening is worth more than any weakness that you might have on your king side. Um, in any case, black continues knight to f6. White continues pawn to e3. So white is uh, building the stone wall. The reason this is called the stone wall is white's pawns kind of resemble a wall. So we have the d4, e3, f4 pawns established in the center for white. Black plays e6. White plays knight to f3. This is the fourth move of the... Uh, the first eight moves are kind of... When I usually teach my students this opening, I'll tell them the first eight moves are the basic stonewall plan, and after that there's a little more uh, flexibility in how you can proceed, but um, you can kind of think about it that way. So in this game, black continues pawn to c5. Now, should white capture the pawn on c5, it's not to be recommended because black will continue bishop takes pawn, and uh, basically white is helping black develop the bishop. So. Rather than that, white plays pawn to c3, protecting the d4 pawn with the c3 pawn. Now if black decides to take, white will take with c3, with the c pawn rather than the e pawn, to maintain that d, e, f uh, pawn triangle. So in any case, black plays knight c6, developing another knight. White plays bishop d3, and in this particular opening system, 
This is where the bishop wants to go. Pointing at the h7 square, and especially if black castles kingside, that may become critical. Um, okay, black plays pawn to d6, mirroring this idea. Uh, white castles kingside, black castles kingside. By the way, uh, going back to the black's bishop moving to d6, uh, you'll notice that the white's f-pawn is obstructing that bishop, which is uh, an important point to notice. Okay, so white castles, black castles. White plays knight on b to d2. Now, this knight moves to d2 where it supports the f3 knight. If the f3 knight is captured, the d2 knight can recapture, taking its place. So... Right now, the position that white has on the board is the basic stonewall attack plan. These are eight. These first eight moves constitute what I normally would teach my students to be the basic stonewall attack plan. And from here, we'll see uh, how white will continue. So, black plays pawn to b6. Now, before making this video, I actually did some computer analysis of the game, and the evaluations for black are okay. The game is evaluated as fairly equal. But what you'll see happening starting with this pawn to b6 move is that black will start kind of migrating towards the queen side with all of the pieces, and white will attack on the king side. And although the computer doesn't seem to see a problem with it until, until a little bit later in the game, uh, in our human mind thinking, it's kind of like really clear for white what to do. White is bringing the pieces to the king side to attack the king. Black is bringing the pieces to the queen side, which doesn't help in the defense. So, in any case, it's an attack that's kind of easy to understand as white. So white continues with knight to e5, posting the knight on a strong square. Uh, rather than just capturing the knight, black plays bishop b7, a uh, logical follow-up to that pawn to b6 advance, but again, another piece just moving over to the queen side where it won't be much use defending the king. Uh, white plays pawn to g4. Now you might hesitate to play a pawn move like this because it weakens your king side, but in this case, the positive, which is you're trying to displace that f6 knight, um, white is thinking that that will outweigh the negative of any kind of king safety issue. Uh, right now black doesn't have a real way to exploit that king safety issue, so. Pawn to g4, queen to c7 again, bringing another piece to the queen side when the defense is needed on the king side. And even though the computer still sees this position as okay for black, I think most, most humans would prefer to be white. So white continues with the logical follow-up to the last move, pawn to g5. Uh, attacking the knight, the knight moves, knight to d7. And now white has a shot. Um, take a look at this position if you want to pause the video and see... Um, Basically what's going on is the, the pieces have all moved over, for black, the pieces have all moved over to the queen side. The king is looking a little bit shaky because there's not a lot of defenders. So as white, how would you exploit this? So if you want to pause and look for some ideas for white and then press play when you're ready, uh, go ahead and do that. And You can do that at any point in the video uh, just to kind of get your thoughts together and see if uh, any of your ideas were actually played in the game. Um, okay. So, in the game, white plays a sacrifice. Bishop takes pawn on h7, check, and black accepts. King takes, and why did white give the bishop this way? Because the follow-up to that move is this move. And again, if you want to pause before I show you the move, go ahead and then press play. Okay, white continues, queen to h5, check. Black retreats to g8. So the king is looking a little exposed, this is looking a little dangerous. Um, how does white continue? Well, white continues by bringing another piece into the attack with rook to f3. Black plays pawn to f6, giving the king a potential retreat square on f7, uh, depending on what happens, because white's, move, white's previous rook to f3 move leads to the logical follow-up on the next move, which is rook to h3. Uh, now, it's interesting, rook to h3, after this move is played, the computer still evaluates this as a very slight edge for white, but obviously this looks really frightening, and as black, you probably wouldn't be happy to play this position, um, despite the fact that a computer may be able to hold it just fine. So anyway, uh, black blunders here, as is very easy to do in these types of positions. Uh, the computer recommends the following move, knight on c takes knight on e5. Um, 
But, you know, we're not computers and we don't always find this stuff. And if you or I were in this position, we might do as Black did here, which is play pawn on f takes knight on e5. And now take a look here. This is a critical point in the game. After white's next move, Black actually resigned. So see if you can see what you will what you would play here as white to kind of seal the deal. So what is the strongest move for white in this position? Uh, feel free to pause and press play. Okay, so white actually played pawn to g6 and black resigned. Why? Because the white queen is threatening to invade on h7 or h8 with checkmate. It's impossible for a black to block both of these squares. Let's say, for example, he played knight to f6, blocking the h7 square there would still be queen to h8 checkmate. So no matter what black does, mate is coming on h7 or h8. So uh, let's go back over this game one more time, much more quickly this time. d4, d5, f4, and f6. e3, e6. Knight f3, c5. Pawn c3 protecting, setting up the four pawn stonewall formation. Knight c6. Bishop d3, bishop d6, castles kingside, castles kingside, knight on b to d2, completing the first eight moves of the stone wall, which constitute what I normally teach as the basic plan. Okay, pawn to b6, beginning the queenside migration, knight to e5, bishop to b7, continuing that move over to the queenside, pawn to g4, aiming to displace the knight, queen to c7, ignoring the threat, pawn g5, hitting the knight, knight d7, running away from the pawn, bishop h7 check, bishop takes h7 check, um, ripping open the, the king side after king takes bishop, queen to h5 check, queen back to g8, rook to f3, preparing rook to h3, pawn to f6, preparing perhaps to, uh, in some lines, give the king an escape square on f7, Rook to h3, preparing to attack on the h-file with the queen and rook, very dangerous looking. Now the blunder, pawn on f takes knight, and after pawn to g6, sealing that f7 square, that's the important point. Now the, the king cannot escape to f7 after this pawn to g6 move. And checkmate is unavoidable on h7 or h8. After, for example, knight to f6, blocking h7, we still have queen h8 checkmate. So. I think this is a really, really cool game that teaches a really, really useful opening for beginners and even intermediate level players to learn. It's very easy to play. Uh, the plan is very clear, particularly if your opponent castles kingside. Even if not, though, you can still formulate a, a plan and uh, use the same setup. So it's a good opening to know, and this particular game is a good example of how it can be effective if uh, black makes some sort of mistake. And um, another thing I recommend is, is uh, when you come upon a game that is fairly short like this that you feel is useful for you to know, I actually think it's useful to try to memorize as much of the game as you can um, just to test kind of your memory skills and also to, to be able to try to visualize uh, even a small portion of the game in your head is, is a way to improve your calculation skills that uh, could prove useful in any kind of over-the-board play you do or even like blitz play online. Uh, the more you can visualize in your head, the more variations you can see without actually having to move the pieces, the better your chess will become. So, uh, And the more you can remember the moves, um, the better your memory will be. And memory and visualization are obviously very important in chess, so I recommend doing those types of exercises as well. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. I'll share another video soon, and thank you very much for your support.